Good morning, Harvest Ridge. You are still Harvest Ridge wherever you are, uh, in your house, in your car, maybe sitting on a beach somewhere watching online, people around the world. Thank you for joining us today. It's a privilege to bring God's Word to you. And I have a message today, I believe, that's straight from God. But before we get all carried away with the, the good stuff, there was a guy who drove past me on a tractor yesterday, and he yelled, The end of the world is here! I knew him. It was Farmer Geddon. Yes, Farmer Geddon. Anyway, you'll get it later. All right. Hey, uh, our verse is from Philippians. We're in Philippians chapter 2 today. So if you got a Bible, uh, follow along with me. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to... Um, it's a little different preaching to just uh, a screen. So I tell you what, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to act just like you're here actually act better than if you're here. So when I say something and you're like, that deserves an amen, give it to me. The Holy Spirit will, come on, he'll energize us both. So let's go today, all right? Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11 says, Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and has given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Could we pray and ask God to bless this message today? Jesus, I pray that today you would speak to our hearts as we hear your word spoken. God, I pray that you would reach across distance and time and space to wherever each person is listening to this message. And today, you would declare Jesus as Lord. There is something about the name of Jesus. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And I pray that today, as we look into that great truth, that we would understand that you are God and you have a way of calming our fears when we trust in you. In the name of Jesus, amen. So do you ever wonder if this Jesus stuff is real? Anybody ever wonder that? I feel that way sometimes. I, I question that. As a matter of fact, I believe it's pretty accurate stuff. Uh, one day, my, uh, my dad, uh, my dad lived to be 81 years old, 82 years old, his 82nd birthday. And, uh, the year before he passed away, my, my dad, who had served Jesus for over 70 years of his life, was sitting with me one day and said, uh, am I going to go to heaven? A guy who had been faithful to Jesus his entire life, following Jesus his entire life, he lived the kind of life you're supposed to if you're a follower of Jesus. And this man had questions about whether or not he was going to make it into heaven. Man, can you imagine that feeling? How can a guy that is so faithfully walked with Jesus have those kind of issues and doubts and struggles? And the answer is very real. Pain causes people to act and think in ways that are not normal. You know, that's the reason there's no toilet paper in any of the stores, because pain causes people to act and think in ways that are not normal. And in moments of great pain or uncertainty, anxiety or hardship, these are the moments that it's easy to forget the very things that ground us and hold us faithful and hold us stable. In these moments of pain, we begin to focus on the pain instead of focusing upon the facts that have held our lives stable. Um, this is a perfect example. Pain causes you to focus on the pain. A couple years ago, my wife was playing softball. 
She, uh, it was actually the, ten, the night before the 10th anniversary of Harvest Ridge Church. And, and she was our only piano player, and she was supposed to play piano the next Sunday morning. Uh, it was Saturday night. We were playing a softball game, and she laced a shot in the outfield. I mean, just knocked the soup out of the ball. And, and she's running, and she's going to second base. And I have no idea what came into her brain, but she decided, I'm going to slide. Now, there was a problem. The week before, it had been rainy, so there was a mud puddle right in front of second base. So when she went to slide, the leg that bent underneath her got caught in the mud and there was a massive crack. And she rolled over and she's holding her leg and it was at a weird shifted angle dangling down and she popped it and held it back upright. And as she's doing this, I realized there was a problem because I haven't heard my wife be short with anybody probably in my entire life. She just so nice. And some guy came over and said, let's just pick her up and get her off the field and and, uh, we can keep playing. And Robin said, you touch me, you die. (laughs) Well, maybe not quite that drastic, but it was almost that drastic because this woman who would never offend anybody in that moment of pain was so intent on being focused on the pain. You see, what do you do when your world's turned upside down? How do you live through the anxiety and the stress of it all? How do you do this? Well, this letter we're looking at, the letter of Philippians, is Paul's example of how do you deal with such situations? How do you deal with pain? Remember, the letter is written from prison. How do you deal with the anxiety? Remember, it's written to people that are living according to 2 Corinthians 8, 2. The Macedonians were in extreme poverty. So it's from prison to people in extreme poverty in a time when Paul is about to die for his faith and it seems the entire thing is turning upside down. Yet Paul uses the word joy in the letter of Philippians, this four chapters. He uses the word joy 14, I'm sorry, 16 times in an attempt to share how you can live joyously in the middle of an anxious time. Because there's a, a, a way to maintain your foundation and your joy in the middle of crisis and strife and anxiety. So this passage today is his... I will say it's the anchor upon which the rest of the truth of the entire letter rests. And it's a hymn. It is a hymn that was sung, and we'll look at the hymn in a couple of minutes. But let's look, first of all, there are three declarations made in this hymn about Jesus. And let's look at the first one. The first one is that Jesus is God. Now, the earliest teachings of the church proclaimed Jesus as God. He wasn't a created being. As a matter of fact, there was some argument about that and heresies, and and there were councils and things like that. And, And the people who bore upon their body the scars for proclaiming a resurrected Jesus under times of intense persecution were the ones that were called to this council in Nicaea. Well, it's called the the Nicene uh, Council, the Council of Nicaea. And it happened around 350 AD. And this council, they called together these elders who had all risked their lives for the cause of Christ. And they were there to argue and debate whether or not Jesus was a created being or whether he was God before the creation of the world. So these guys, they, uh, they had a belief and they had a truth that was passed on to them. And Arianism was a, a teaching that was sort of growing. There was a struggle going on in early Christianity. Is Jesus really God? Was he God before the world began? Or is he a created being? Is he something that just sort of uh, God made as the best creation? And that was the argument. And this is what the Nicene Creed said. The council, this council came up with the creed. And it says these words. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. So there's one God. How many gods are there? There's one God. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Now, he's the Son of God, but what does this mean? It says he was begotten from the Father before all ages. And begotten sounds to us like a term that says he was born. But he wasn't born because begotten means more than that. Begotten just simply means a part of the family lineage in the ancient languages. And then, in case you were wondering, they described what this Jesus means. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of the same essence as the Father. So Jesus himself is God, the same with God in nature and essence and being, 
And through him, all things were made. And by assigning creation to Jesus, we know that God is the creator. By assigning creation to him, they are calling Jesus God as well. So Jesus is God. Well, that's what the early church fathers said. But what does the Bible say? So let's look. Scripture clearly teaches that Jesus is God. In this hymn, let's look at this hymn. It is a hymn here in Philippians. And in the first stanza, it starts out, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, it says, who being in very nature God. Now the word there, morphe, in the Greek means that he was the very exact being of God. He is the form of God. He is who God is. And it says that being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God. He was equal with God because he was God, is God from the beginning of time. And it wasn't something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing. So God himself condescended to become human and to walk on the face of this earth. The very form, the very nature, the very being of God became man and walked on this earth in Jesus Christ. Now that's the the message of Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 and 7. That's called the kenosis theory in my theological training. But the same concept is also declared in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Jesus is the character of God. The, the literal Greek word here is character. It says in Philippian, or Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation, the character, the actual being of who God is. When we look at Jesus, when we see Jesus, we see God. He is the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now, God commands, as well in this passage, as if, as if Jesus being equal with God and the representation of God isn't good enough. In this passage, God commands that Jesus be worshipped. Look at it. It's in Hebrews 1.6. And again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says... Firstborn, by the way, is not birth. It's, it's, firstborn means preeminence. The word there in the Greek uh, speaks of, of not of birth, but of lineage, of being a part of the family and the first in the family. And when he brings his first in the world, he says, notice what he says, let all the angels worship him. Now, why is this important? Because God commands that Jesus be worshiped. How does this mean God, Jesus is God? Well, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus, listen to what Jesus said. He said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, you see what I've done here is I've done two things. Number one, we've talked about Jesus being in very nature and being and exactly who God is in human form. And then we talked about the fact that Jesus is to be worshipped by angels, but yet Jesus himself said that only God is to be worshipped, but yet he received worship. Hmm. You can read about it in John chapter 9. Jesus also received worship there. <coughs> One more thing. This, you say, why does it matter? Let me tell you why it matters. The other day I was talking to a young man who's a good young man, and I like him a lot. I like him a lot. But he thinks Jesus is just some created being. And if Jesus is just some created being, then that means when he died as a sinless sacrifice to end the covenant of the law, it didn't end because God didn't die. But if Jesus is God, then we don't have to live under the fear and the bondage of the covenant of the law. Jesus is God matters. One more thing. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Do you see that right there? The Word was God. So who is this Word? John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and made us dwelling among us. So Jesus is the Word, and we know that Jesus is God. Now, these things matter because a proper understanding of who Jesus is means that we have a proper understanding of how he interacts with our lives. Jesus is God. One, can I give you one more? One more passage, all right? I could do this for hours, but I'm going to give you this final one. In Exodus three fourteen, God said to Moses, God's name is, I am who I am. John chapter 8, verse 58 says this, Jesus answered him, before Abraham was born, 
Now, if he was using the proper tense of verb, there are different tenses of verbs in the language they used. And the proper tense would have been to say, before Abraham was born, I was. But he didn't say, before Abraham was born, I was. What did he say? He said, before Abraham was born, I am. Why would he say that? Because Jesus is declaring he is the I am that I am. I've taken some time to share some scriptures to show that Jesus is God. And the reason I did that is very simple. If you will get this truth in your heart, that Jesus isn't just some being, he is actually God, then you can begin to trust him as he really is, the God of the universe. What I'm hoping happened in this moment was this. All right, you ready for this? Right? When I was in Algebra 2, I am not the world's best student. As a matter of fact, I believe C's get degrees. That was sort of my way of saying it. And I was not the best student in the world. And I was in high school, and I was trying to figure out math. And, and I had a teacher. We had four people in my advanced math class, and it was a rough class. And my teacher was not the best teacher in the world. And he would try to explain to me Algebra 2. And I would sit there beating my head against the wall. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And then and one thing would be said or one a buddy of mine would share hey this is what you need to do or this is what he's saying and when that happened boom the light bulb came on and I understood the problem and I never ever struggled with the problem again because the light bulb came on and the truth became clear and I'm praying today that the truth would become clear in your heart that Jesus is God the maker, the creator, the sustainer of the universe. All right, there's a second truth here, and it's that Jesus is Lord. Now, this passage is actually an early church hymn. So what I want to do is we're going to put up on the screen, we're going to put uh, this, this passage up of this hymn that we just read as our text today. We're going to read it in a strophied form. Now, strophied means A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. Each A, B, C is a strophe. And I, what I want you to see is there's a nature of condescension. There's a nature of Jesus coming down, the lowest point of his coming down, and then his ascension back up into glory. Him leaving glory, becoming a human, and then his ascension back into glory. And we want to do this to declare that Jesus is Lord. There are a couple things I need to say about this hymn before we jump into it too much. First of all, this hymn in Philippians chapter 2, 6 through 11 has rhyme, rhythm, and meter. What that means is it's not only organized in pattern, but it's got rhythm to it, it's got meter to it, it's got rhyme to it. That means this is a song. It was meant to be sung. And we know from letters to like Pliny in the early first century that, that there are uh, the church met together to worship by singing hymns to Christ as to a God. And I quote the letter from Pliny. So this is a, a hymn that Paul had probably taught the people of Philippi when he planted the church in AD 50. So AD 50, just 20 years from the death, burial, and resurrection story of Jesus, there is a hymn that is in such format and style as to do this. So let's look at it. Now, it's trophy, let's look. A, who being in very nature with God, B, did not consider equality with God. C, something to be grasped. So this one's talking about who God was in heaven and how he's beginning to condescend. And then A, he made himself nothing, took on the nature of a servant. C, being made in human likeness. And then A, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to death and became obedient to death. So here is God, Jesus in heaven. He is God, and he begins to take on the nature of humanity and come down and eventually died. And then, even death on the cross. We'll come back to that in a second. And then A, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow, every, in things in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and back to the glory with God the Father and to God the Father. You notice how this hymn is about Jesus coming down and being humble, but yet when you're humble and you do what God wants, God raises you regardless of the situation. So there's an ancient template here I want you to see as well. One more thing. Where it says in this passage, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. I know because I was reading a book on Roman history a couple of months ago. 
couple years ago, and as I was reading this book, I came across this line, and it says, Hear Jupiter, hear Janus, hear all you gods in heaven. Now, this is a Roman war. This is a Roman war declaration. This was how they declared war. They said, Hear the gods, and they said, The gods in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And those are the exact words. Aren't those the exact same words we read in this hymn? You see, what's going on here is whoever penned this hymn in worship to Jesus was saying that Jesus, by coming down from heaven to become a man, had declared war on the powers of darkness in this present age. Somebody ought to say amen right there. Because Jesus declared war on the powers of evil and darkness and sin and oppression. And it says in this passage, he not only declared war on them, but he won I'm about to get all fired up. Y'all better stick with me. Let's go. Come on. De two rounds with the devil. Here we go. And I won't win because I'm good. I'd win because Jesus has already won. So here's this song. And, and it's a song he taught them. And it's a song that's got, it's got in the center what is the lowest point, the lowest point of Jesus' condescension coming down to earth. The lowest point is death on a cross. But what he did with the death on the cross is he declared himself Lord by defeating the powers of darkness. Listen to me, Christian. If you're a follower of Jesus, God did not call you to resort living but to warfare. And part of the reason that we lose so many fights and we give in to anxiety and tension is because we think we're in it to be comfortable when God called you to fight. And I've talked to people that have fought wars. And they'll tell you that wars are not comfortable. Wars are not easy. They're dangerous. They hurt. But when you fight, you fight to win. And God tells us in the scriptures that Jesus came down, died on a cross, but he was resurrected in power and he wins. And because he wins, we win too. And it says at the very end there, to the glory of God, the father, to the glory of God, the father. You see, God will get glory no matter how bad and how dark the dissension is, no matter how tough the situation is, that no matter what the anxiety or the stress or the pain or the, the lack that you're going through, no matter how deep the valley gets, you're not only going to come out of it, but God's going to get glory through it. Because Jesus wins. Because Jesus is Lord. Real quick story from my childhood. Jesus is Lord. We used to play a, a game when I was a kid. We had a cellar out behind our house, and the cellar was where we'd go when the storms would hit in Oklahoma. But, you know, we, we'd go on the cellar, and I remember we got some boxing gloves, and it was, uh, it was called the victor of the cellar, you know? We would put our boxing gloves on, and it was a square cellar top, and it was elevated at one place about this tall, and the other side there was a slope off, so it was about that tall. And, and what we'd do is we'd get there, and we'd box me and the neighborhood boys would have a boxing match and the one who who left the cellar top was the loser but the one who either outboxed or outpunched or outlasted the other one that was the one that was the victor and that's what we did when we were kids you know we'd box on top of that until somebody fell off or got pushed off or got knocked off the victor things on heaven Things in earth and things under the earth all lose to Jesus because he is the victor. Jesus is the Lord. Last of all, Jesus is our example. I could use an amen from somewhere. Somebody shout amen anyway. All right. Jesus is the example. Jesus is our example is the last of all. It, it, literally, Philippians 2.5 leading up to this great hymn tells us this. It says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus. How do you have joy in the middle of anxiety? How do you win when you have the same mind as Jesus? And what was his mind? Well, let me, before we get to his mind, let me ask you a simple question. Do you think you would have less anxiety in your life if you thought like Jesus? I, I was reading a devotion this past week, and you know, Jesus is asleep in the boat. He told him, get in the boat, let's go to the other side of the lake. 
He gets in the boat, falls asleep. The waves come, they're crashing over. And you get, by the way, you may get wet in the boat, but if Jesus said you're going to make it to the other side, you're going to make it to the other side. You may be wet, but you're going to get there. You may be soaked, you may be scared, but if Jesus said you're going to get there, you're going to get there. And they're like all scared, and they're like, oh, Jesus, when you wake up? And Jesus gets up and says, wind, wave, shut up, calm. You see, a lot of us want the moment where Jesus says, wind, wave, shut up. But real faith comes in the moment. When Jesus said, go to the other side, Jesus said, you can make it. Jesus said, you're a victor. Jesus said to overcome. He says that, and the real faith comes in when you stick to what he said, even though the circumstances look like they're out of control. Would you? Would you live a little more peaceful life if you thought like Jesus? Would you live a little bit more peaceful life if you actually thought like Jesus? You thought... It doesn't matter if I condescend, no matter how low it goes, because God's going to elevate and God will get the glory. Hmm. Thought like Jesus. So how else did Jesus think? Well, Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do you know why we have so much trouble? I'll tell you why we have so much trouble. Because we've got a lot of selfish ambition. We want what we want, when and how we want it. And we've got vain conceit. We, we want our pleasure and our good times. But Jesus said, no, no, Jesus didn't do that. He did nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, he valued others above himself. He wasn't looking to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. So I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Do you think you'd be more at peace if you acted like Jesus? I, I think you'd be more at peace if you thought like Jesus, but would you be more at peace if you acted like Jesus? If you actually considered other people sometimes and not just your own thoughts and your own feelings. I had a story. I'm not going to tell you the story. It doesn't matter. But I did something kind for somebody the other day. And man, did it put a smile on my face. How about in this time where everybody around us is losing their loving minds how about if you say a nice word for somebody? You say thanks to the person behind the counter when you get your gas or something like that, and you say, thank you for serving today. Everybody I've said that to smiles. How about if you find something and, and you be kind? Maybe you prepare some food and take it to a neighbor. I don't know. What can you do? Be kind. Maybe call somebody that's been quarantined for a while. Be kind. Because Jesus didn't look for his own selfish ambition, but for the interest of others. And study after study after study after study in this world shows the same thing. You ready for this? That when you serve somebody, your joy level goes up. All right. Last of all, let's conclude. Let's land this plane. Y'all ready? Let's land the plane. This whole series about how to overcome the anxiety that tries to cripple us. And we become anxious... When we, don't think God, uh, when we don't think and we don't behave like Jesus. And our text is a reminder that Jesus is God. That means he's in control. Jesus is Lord. That means he wins. And it's also a call for us to start thinking like him. In this letter, Paul's going to do this over and over and over and over and over again. This is what he's going to do. You ready? He's going to call us to remember the blessings that Jesus has given us. And by thinking about the positive things, we can't, you can't dwell on the positive and the negative at the same time. And by dwelling on the positive things, our attitude will be filled with joy in the middle of crisis. So I want you to back all the way up to Philippians 2, 1 and 2. And you ready? This is what he says. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in his spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit more next week. But I want you to see that he encourages you to think positive thoughts, to remember the positive things. So, took a vacation a couple weeks ago. And... Um, I, 
I love when I go on vacation. I, I get up early in the morning. My wife stays in bed for a little bit longer, but I'm up. I greet the sunrise. I go out. I read my Bible. I pray. I, I enjoy my mornings talking to God. I'd been there three or four days, and the morning devotions had been goofed up because it got so cold and blah, blah, blah. And it's like nothing was on work in the right way. And I'm like being a little grumpy about it all. So um, it, it was early one morning toward the end of the vacation. I, I'm laying in bed, and about 6.30 in the morning, boom, my eyes popped wide open, and I heard the words. <laughs> the words were, um, come talk to me. Let's talk. I got excited. I popped straight up out of bed. I grabbed my Bible. I put my clothes on. I ran out. I ran to my place. I sat down, and I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, God, you said let's talk. Let's talk. Silence. I'm like, okay. All right, God. And I feel the Holy Spirit urge me and say, what would you tell everybody else to do? Well, I would tell them to have a pattern and to stick to the pattern. So I did. I grabbed my Bible and I did the, my pattern. I started reading my pattern. The problem was is that my pattern was stupid. I started reading verses and chapters that they... We're talking about stuff that just made me mad. I mean, I have problems and questions with God in the Bible. It's all right to have those problems. I have those problems. And every single chapter I read had a multitude of them. I thought we were going to talk, God. Instead, all I get is more garbage. I was mad. Oh, I was mad. I finally finished my Bible reading, and I'm sitting there. I'm now getting a little pouty. I'm like, God, I thought we were going to talk. I thought you were going to say something good. I thought this was going to be awesome. You could hear the crickets. Nothing. No encouragement, no move of the Spirit, no pleasant emotions. Nothing. I'm just sitting there praying the same old prayers, the same old way. Have I ever felt like that? So it wasn't a real good day. Started wrong. My expectations were goosebumps and joy and answers to my prayers. And what did I get? Problems and silence. Now, a little later that day, I'm reading a book. It's a great book. You should read it. It's called Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus. And I'm reading this book. And wouldn't you know, the answer to my morning prayer hits me in the face like a punch like I've never gotten from anybody. And it said this. I'll read you the quote. This is exactly the kind of evidence that too many Christians accept as the final truth about much more important matters, such as answered prayer, God's judgment, Christ's forgiveness and salvation. And here's the line that got me. It said, the only person they consult is themselves and the only experience they evaluate is the most recent 10 minutes. Man, when I read that, it was just boom right in my face. Because here's what happened. I wanted God to be awesome in this moment. And in this moment, I only encountered a problem. And what do you do when you're wanting encouragement and all you get is more struggle? How do you stay joyous in the middle of that? How do you stay joyous when you're not only quarantined, but now they're cutting your income? How do you stay joyous when maybe your family isn't acting right? How do you stay joyous? Here's how you do it right here. You stop thinking about this 10 minutes and you recount. Do you have any comfort or any encouragement from Christ, any compassion, any joy, any tenderness? Have you ever experienced anything from God? Just get out of the past 10 minutes and go back and recount. Turn your mind towards the blessings you have received instead of living in the moment of difficulty you have at this moment. You see, I was there when the check arrived miraculously that paid the bill to the penny. I was there when I was healed, and I didn't expect anything to happen, but God healed me anyway. And I was there when God healed the lady that was never supposed to walk again, and she's still walking today. I was there when the heroin addict got 
free and now lives free and now plays in our worship band. I was there when God spoke and the answer came in the middle of the crisis and I knew we were going to make it. And I was there when God provided, when God showed up again and again and again. And the way to stay grounded is to remember that Jesus is God and Jesus is Lord and he sets us the example not to think about us but to press on toward the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. You know, we sang some songs today about Jesus being Lord, about the name and about the power of Jesus. And we're going to sing one final song in just a second. And that final song is going to declare that Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead. He is victorious. Every knee in heaven and every knee on earth and every knee under the earth will bow and they will declare that Jesus is Lord. And if you're facing a trial and a crisis and a struggle in you today, maybe what you need to do is get right up off that couch and you need to turn around and bow your knee and declare, Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, be my Lord. And when we sing this song, I want you to do it wherever you're at. I want you to stop the car, pull off to the side of the road, bow your knee. I don't care what you're doing. Get off the, uh, the exercise bike. Would you bow your knee to Jesus Christ? Would you declare him as Lord and sing this song like you mean it and pray it like you mean it? Hey, and if this is the first time that you bow your knee to Jesus and declare him as Lord, here's what I want you to do. There's, a, there's an email address at the bottom of this screen, info at harvestridge.net. I want you to send me an email, info at harvestridge.net. If this is your first time to declare Jesus as Lord, I want you to send an email to us and we're going to declare declare together and we're going to pray together and agree together that God's going to give you the victory and you're going to live in the power and the presence of God because he is Lord. Could we pray together right now? Jesus, we thank you that you are God. We thank you that you are Lord and we thank you that you are victor. We thank you that Paul quoted a song that he taught the Philippian church and that song teaches clearly your victory, your lordship, and you are now glorifying God, and you are, are an example to us of the way we should live before this world to see. And God, I pray that you would help us today to turn our hearts and to turn our minds and our thoughts to you, that we would confess you as God and Lord and King, and we would follow your example by loving you and loving the people around about us. And as we sing this song in declaration, would our hearts cry out, Jesus, be my Lord. Amen and amen. Yeah.